Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Happy New Year. I think I can say that for a few more days. I want to um, introduce myself and then we will start with our program today. My name is Peggy Trosper and I am an instructor and the continuing education coordinator with the University of Alabama School of Social Work. Thank you for joining us today. This is our first Noontime Knowledge Series program for 2022 on the topic of self-care, resilience, and healing in social work. As we enter year three of a global pandemic, this topic is timely and, and relevant. Before I introduce today's esteemed guests panelists, I want to first let you know that we would, um, we're, we're asking you to place any questions, comments, suggested resources that are applicable to today's program in the chat box. We'll be monitoring that throughout the program. Okay, so without further ado, and to be mindful of everybody's time, I'm going to introduce today's presenters. So it's my pleasure to start with Carmen Reese Foster. Ms. Foster is currently an assistant professor of practice, the director of alumni affairs, and the online field coordinator for graduate students at the University of Tennessee College of Social Work. She's the founder and current chair of the Tennessee Statewide Field Consortium. In 2018, she created the Coalition of Black Social Workers as a student organization at the University of Tennessee, and it has grown into a nonprofit 501c3 status where she serves as the executive director. The CBSW exists to engage, connect, and empower Black social work students and professionals. She's also the owner of Pieces Training and Consulting, conducting trainings on anti-racism, social emotional learning, and cross-cultural engagement for churches, nonprofits, and schools. Prior to transitioning into higher ed, <clears throat> excuse me, Carmen's practice experience focused on working with youth and families from marginalized communities. Carmen's currently a DSW student at the University of Alabama School of Social Work, where her research focus is on assessing the impact of race-based trauma on the mental health of Black social work providers. Carmen was also the 2021 winner of the three minute thesis competition for the University of Alabama Graduate School. Yay, and Carmen also obtained her bachelor's from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and her master's degree in social work from the University of Maryland, Baltimore. Welcome, Carmen. Next, Dr. Sharonda Green. Dr. Sh Dr. Green is an assistant professor at the University of Alabama School of Social Work. She holds a PhD in human services, clinical social work from Walden University, a master's of social work degree from the University of Georgia, a master of arts in sociology from Georgia Southern University, and a bachelor of arts in psychology from Bruton Parker College. Teaching across the curriculum, Dr. Green is a licensed clinical social worker and a certified school social worker. She has over 20 years of clinical and social work, direct practice experience in diverse practice settings, and over 12 years of distance online education experience. Dr. Green's research interests and focus is on factors that impact Black women's mental health and well being, professional self care, social work education, and clinical social work. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Green. Dr. Jason Newell, he's a professor and director with the University of Montevallo Social Work Program, Department of Behavioral and Social Sciences. He received his bachelor's degree in psychology from Auburn University, his master's and PhD in social work from the University of Alabama School of Social Work. Dr. Newell is a licensed independent clinical social worker and a private individual practitioner with an endorsement in clinical and social casework. Dr. Newell has been in the fields of social work, practice, research, and education for over 20 years. His research and specialty areas include clinical social work practice with the mentally ill, treatment of anxiety, trauma-related and mood disorders, self-care and professional resilience, practice with veterans and military families, and child welfare. Dr. Newell has been published widely in professional journals and books and has recently published a textbook, Cultivating Professional Resilience and Direct Practice, a guide for service professionals from Columbia University Press. And last but certainly not least, Today's program will be moderated by our very own Sharon Wilkes. Ms. Wilkes is an instructor with the University of Alabama School of Social Work and the founder of the Noontime Knowledge Series. Sharon, thank you. I'm now gonna pass the virtual mic over to you. 
Thank you, Peggy, for that warm introduction. Uh, greetings, everyone. We're so excited to hold this panel today uh, to talk about a very important topic on self-care resiliency and healing and social work practice. And so honored to be joined by our very own Dr. Green and uh, Ms. Foster and Dr. Newell. And so to start our panel discussion, I, I just want to pose, pose this question to either panelist. Are social workers ethically ob obligated to practice self-care? And, and if so, and we know that to be, what does that look like? So I'll jump in on this one. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for, for being here today. Um, thank you, Sharon, for organizing all of this. This is such an important discussion. Um, our code of ethics is a living document, and it just recently went through a change and a revision last summer. And that, that specific change that was made was to add self-care language to our code of ethics. So what happened was, was after George Floyd and after the start of COVID and seeing all of the burnout that was taking place in our profession, um, you know, the powers that be said, we need to change our language. We need to make social work self-care a priority because that is not something that is standard across the board. And if it's in the code of ethics, the, the hope, right, is that that is something that we look to and that makes it standard across the board. And so I absolutely think that a lot of us were using language like, oh, yes, self-care, it's an ethical mandate for social work, but now it's actually in our code of ethics. And the really neat thing about that is, is as the language starts, it says professional self-care is paramount for competent and ethical social work practice. And so as a profession, we have said, you know what, this is paramount. This is important. This is one of the most significant things that we need to do in order to practice competently and ethically. And so absolutely wholeheartedly, I think that, that we, are, we are instructed to do that through our code. Thank you, Ms. Foster. Uh, Dr. Newell, Dr. Green. So I would I would just like to add a specific um to add on to what um Ms. Foster was saying too in terms of it being a, a competence like a, a competence number one it's like a cultural it's also the language that was changed was it being under a cultural competence as well um in order to like balance and to preserve preserve yourself as a practitioner as a social worker and to promote a career and a professional longevity it is important that that is a part of your practice. And some of the things uh, that fall up under professional self-care in terms of you taking care of yourself is continuing education is the thing that you're actually doing right now, which I like to point out that you're taking time to do this, to be informed and to be aware and to start your spring uh, semester off really well. And um, that it's a part of you being able to thrive. So while you are doing things about your day, it is really important for you to be putting yourself on your to-do list and making that a priority, the things that you make a priority as reflected in the new language um, is also, a, a, it becomes a habit and it becomes a practice. And what I find that that does too, it changes not only your, it changes your practice environment. When people around you see that you're practicing these things, it is also a gentle reminder to others. It changes your work environment. It can change your um, the energy of, of the institutions that you're in, that when you prioritize that and say, hey, I need to stop. Hey, I need to take a break. Hey, I need to go get some water. Hey, I need to walk away from my desk or walk away from my screen. So it's really important a way of as, as a sense of embodying that actually practicing and put it on on your schedule to do it. And I would add to what Sharonda and Carmen said to it's really more to Sharonda. We've actually followed suit with CSWE in our standards, which are changing in 2022. And for the first time in sort of from the academic arena, they're also including self-care practice under competency one, which is your professionalism. 
And the power of that to mandate that universities teach this material now is going to allow us to do this work across the board. Whereas before, you know, self-care practice, frankly, in academics could have been in a class, maybe not. If you had a Sharonda, it would be there because that's her area. But maybe the next professor, you know, would see that as fluff or it might be included at the end of the class as an afterthought versus being a part of our curriculums. We're going to have to map curriculum now to demonstrate in the academy that we are providing this mandatory or paramount, as Carmen said, this skill that we are teaching this in the same way that we're teaching human behavior, in the same way that we're teaching human development and family systems and all the other theoretical and practice skills that we provide to our students. So I think this is really gonna be a change in climate for us. And those of us who have been doing the research, you know, we've been on this train, but I don't think if you're on it, you don't always realize that everybody else is not there with you. And so I think this is, we're really gonna see a shift there in terms of maybe in the way that some of our courses look. And Sharon, when you ask, what does this look like, sort of unpacking this construct of self-care? And I, I really think it's become, in many ways, an overused term. I think it's people might understand a basic definition of what it is. So, yeah, self-care, I, I do that, right? Or I go home and, you know, I have a glass of wine after work, self-care. But it's so much more uh, than that. It's, it's a practice. So if you think about it as a skill, like our skills at engaging families and treating families. It's something you have to work on. You have to get better at, you have to learn. It has to become a part of your life as a social worker versus that afterthought. So I'm really you know, excited to see where the academy and you know, our practice community goes with this um, in terms of it now being more of a mandated practice, you know, a mandated ethical code, but also a practice skill mandation. I think that that, that says a lot in terms of where we are. Uh, thank you for uh, weighing in. And so, Jason, you 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 said something that I wanted to go back to uh, Sharon, Sharonda's Dr. Green's uh, question or her comment that is um, that we must put ourselves at the top of our priority list. You know, as social workers, we're inundated with so many deadlines. We have so much to do until sometimes it really spills into our personal time. I mean, like, how do you balance? How do you, you, you continue to separate your personal from your workload when you know there's, you know, there's so much work to be done, you know, especially, you know, you know, you're seeing clients, you're, you know, you have um, reports, you know, you have progress notes, you have all these things to do. So how do you really balance that time? And how do you really put yourself at the top of your priority list without just saying, I'm going to the hair salon or I'm going to give a nail store or I'm going shopping, but I do a little retail therapy. And, and like uh, Dr. Newell said, you, these constructs, I mean, like what does that really look like? And what could you really say to our attendees that could give them some, uh, some, some practical tools and tips that they can use? So the way the way that I talk to students about it is that you know your your education the thing that you have invested in in terms of going back to school and learning learning about social work and that you are applying social work I think that you should be the first partaker of the things that you are learning I think that you should not die on a hill or become a castaway I think that you should first invest in yourself and so investing in yourself to me, when I think about self-care, it's just the same pattern of like when you decide to brush your teeth, when you decide to, <laughs> to go to your doctor's appointment. So whatever that looks like, it has to be, you have to be the first partaker of that. And whatever that kind of ritual, when you ritualize that, it becomes systematic and it becomes a habit and it becomes a, a, a pattern that you, oh, this is what, this is a part of what I do. And when you are full and when you are overflowing, you will have more energy and creativity to do the things that you've been called to do. And there, when you are full, you will have more insight and ability to analyze and ability to, to show up for a client. That is a part of our the professional code of ethics. When you are depleted, it's hard to sit still in the whole space for the people that we serve when we we are, are are tired and when we are overworked and we and those are gateways for stress but gateways for fatigue for burnout 
um, when we do not prioritize our prioritize ourselves, you should be the first partaker of the investment that you are, are learning um, as, as a student, as a CEU, if you've already graduated, you can still go back to that as a foundational way of like governing your life too, to take, um, to take advantage of that. Like you invest, you've invested a lot in your education, you're investing time now, do the things that so that you can have uh, career longevity and diversity Think about uh, human behavior in the social environment. When we talk about the life course, think about yourself as a social worker over the life course, like to have career longevity from this time for 15 years from now, 20 years from now, 35 years from now. The way that you do that over your social work life course is to, to make self-care a priority. Thank you, Dr. Green. Dr. J uh, Newell or Ms. Foster, would you like to add to that before we move on? The only thing that pops up for me is I love that, that Dr. Green gives this imagery of brushing your teeth, making self-care a ritual. I think because the terminology of self-care has become so overused, like Dr. Newell said, and because it's so mainstream now, you'll see people on Instagram saying, oh, I did self-care, and they're like in the Bahamas. That's a vacation, which is wonderful, and I wish that I was there with you, but that is not self-care. Self-care, authentic self-care, is exactly how Dr. Green has laid it out. It is something that is ritualistic. It is a skill that we learn, like Dr. Newell said. And so I think that also our practice has said in the code of ethics that, that we need to use self-care in a way that promotes organizational policies, practices, and materials to support our self-care, right? So when the revision was made, it said, we don't want you as, as the clinician, as the practitioner, as the social worker to be the only one focused on your self-care personally, but we also want to hold your organizations and your agencies accountable for really promoting those practices that also enhance your self-care. And so I like to think of it um, as more of a collective care. From an organizational standpoint, from a macro standpoint, we want to look at this as how can we care for the collective? How can we care for our social workers so that they won't get burnt out, so that they know that they are valued when they walk through these doors, and that we don't just value them for their productivity, but we also value them as human beings. So I think that our organizations are challenged to really think of this as a collective self-care as well. That did raise an interesting point for me because I have a construct for what I think self-care looks like. I have a framework for what that looks like for me and my research. But I'm taken to a place of wonder as this becomes an organizational issue because it is an overused term. And if we're, you know, now charging our organizations to do this work as an ethical mandate and, and we don't have a really clear operational definition of what this looks like, that's going to bring even more challenge because there's no uniformity there. There's no universal definition really of what a self-care practice looks like. So. I kind of default to um, Dr. Green, I love that you took the life course perspective on that. And I kind of go back to sort of the systems approach to self-care for me and my work, it's, it's a holistic practice. And part of that is sort of looking within your life course and moving toward the things that serve you that are life-giving and moving away from maladaptation because what the research says is that when social workers and humans in general are stressed, sometimes they move toward maladaptive behavior and work can be as habit forming as anything else. And so if you look at that from sort of a systems perspective, if the work dimension of your life absorbs your family and absorbs your spiritual life and absorbs, you know, your friends and all the other dimensions of life and it just becomes that big, then those other areas are gonna suffer, right? So if I'm losing time with my family, if I'm losing time in my spiritual life, if I'm losing time with friends and I'm losing time because work is absorbing that, 
then I, maybe I need to look at that framework. You know, can I move these pieces around? And Sharon, I, when you said, you know, how do we table the reports? You know, you know, dealing with bureaucracy and social work is a stress of social work life course, to use Dr. Green's analogy. That is just simply a part of what we do. Most of us work for bureaucratic agencies. So probably I cannot do anything about what goes on in Washington, D.C. or Montgomery today. But I can leave my job at five o'clock and go to my daughter's gymnastics meet and be present for her and not still have my head over there. Does that make sense? So sometimes, you know, for me, social work is as simple as boundaries and creating space and, you know, not allow, because work goes home with Jason, whether, it, you know, I'm in this office or not, right? So it's not going anywhere. I have to take responsibility in drawing those boundaries with myself and allowing myself to put the phone down or whatever I need to do to be in this space. And that's something I can control for that hour or that 90 minutes. Work's not gonna go anywhere. That report, you know, clients are always gonna be coming in. We have no control whether you're gonna get a hundred today or two tomorrow. Like there's so much in social work you simply cannot have control over. So part of that is for me is a self analysis of, okay, what in my environment can I control, right? And what am I losing for work? And so my research reveals, and I can, you know, there are more pieces to this, but I'll tell you the health and wellness behaviors, the ones we tend to throw out first. Dr. Green mentioned going to your doctor appointment. For years, I've done research with social workers and they'll say, you know, no kids missed a doctor's appointment, no mom, you know, nobody else that relies on me, but I've rescheduled mine four times. That's bad, all right? That's not self-care. Like, just look at the simplicity of that. You should know better, right? You would never, you know, you would hold so much shame if your daughter missed her for pediatric appointments. But when it comes to self-care, you have a different perspective, right? I'm less, you know, and social workers are notorious. This shows up thematically in my research over and again. And if you look at the data, I mean, look at our values. What's our first value? Service. <laughs> so serve others, serve. And so, you know, maybe just some of that might just be a, a nice reflection on, you know, how much am I giving myself? And if I give it all away and there's nothing left for me, I go take a bath and have a glass of wine and watch TV. That's, that's not self-care. Take that on the do. If your hygiene ritual or something like that is on your list of self-care, unless it's a really nice, take that off. You, you have a life. You should get to do all these things anyway, right? So don't call things that you just do self-care because then it's not a ritual. So I love that, that word too, because we're not rich. You're ritualizing something not resolving it like new year's i'm going to do better self-care this year and you know by february we're all back right but if it's a ritual it's a pattern it's a change right you're making that behavioral change sorry i'll i'll time out i don't know if sharon's guys on a timer you might have to no this is good information it's very rich um and so I, one analogy I always use is like a flight attendant. You know, a flight attendant will say, before I can save you or help you, I must be oxygenated. So I must put the mask on me first before I can help anyone else. And so it has to be a practice, you know, and not just a ritual like going to the Bahamas or, you know, just going on a really nice trip, you know, but it has to be our way of, of doing, you know, everyday practice like, working out, you know, that, you know, like Dr. Green, you know, that's her practice, you know, work out, find something that will give you that balance and that will bring you that balance. And so this is good. So I would like to kind of shift gears and go to the next, go to another question. What does the practice of self-care for you look like? For you, this is for you. What does it look like? Did I write that question? I have a prepared. <laughs> Dr. Green, if you'd like to go first. Oh, sure. Um, what my my self care uh, practice or my rituals look like for me is um, if I'm when I wake, well, brush my brush my teeth, <laughs> and wash my face. 
daily aff like affirmations, like I have affirmations on my mirror or what I'm saying, I'm remembering kind of like washing my thoughts about how I think about myself. I'm awesome. I'm amazing. Um, there's nobody like me. I'm unique. I'm a designer's original. I, I, I will do great work today. My life is abundant. I will I will walk I'm, I'm to start showing gratitude to my body. Thank you for my arms. Thank you for movement. Thank you for breath. Thank you for mobility. So I say those types of things um, as I'm getting dressed. And one of the rituals too is like to, I work out. So I strength train like five days a week. So I usually put my stuff together before in the morning so that I don't have to be, oh, it's a it's there. It's inviting me to like to in, engage so that I can go to the gym. Or the other parts that I do is like, I try to make sure that I have water because when you have water in your body, our water is, body is predominantly water. Water helps me to think, water helps me to move, water lubricates my limbs, uh, water is, is what is needed, water keeps me grounded. I, I, I flow through water, water flows through me. So I make sure that I do those types of things or whatever to remind myself, to prompt myself to do those things so that I can, be attuned and be a focus and be aware. And sleep is important to me very much. So <laughs> I have reconstructed that in the past several years. And I was thinking what you said, Dr. Newell, about, about pushing a back against, about, uh, against work and productivity, and especially with the things that have happened in the, in the past about social justice and which bodies are supposed to be working more than what bodies and all those kind of constructs that you have to deconstruct to give yourself peace, to rest, to, to sleep, to do those types of things um, in terms of class and mobility and geographic location. So I just try to make sure that I'm kind of thinking about that in, in my body and being mindful. I like what you said too about being mindful, being where my feet are um, so that I can be attuned to how I need to show up. Oh yeah, that hit me deep too. I like the way you said show up at the end. So showing up for yourself and everything you said on the front of that, my research would reveal that's what people throw out first. So that's interesting. So diet and exercise under times of stress, we tend to throw that out first. So maybe like that 545 workout, if you're really tired, it's really easy. At least for me, I'm not as dedicated. I can already tell as you are, Dr. Green. I feel a little guilt or shame hitting that snooze alarm. You know, that's just not a problem for me. So maybe I need to increase the tension a little bit. Uh, dietary habits, people tend to move to eating uh, poorly when they're stressed versus moving to a healthy, you know, that's that's a comp an overcompensation or maladaptive thing. The affirmation, so under stress, feeling burnout or compassion fatigue, we tend to self-reflect negatively and get into instead of, I am good enough for this day. I'm not good enough. I'm not a good enough social worker. I'm not a good enough parent or I'm not doing enough for, you know, my family. I'm not doing enough for this and sort of get into that internal dialogue. I call it the kind of the story we tell in our heads that that we're not good enough and working against that, you know, is one way to practice self-care to sort of, you know, giving yourself permission to one correct, but also to reflect on probably the 95% you are doing right, right? Instead of the 5% that's not there. You asked about my ritual. That was my question. So I have several, I have daily practices. So I, I do try to practice a spiritual ritual, you know, or do something. I'm a man of faith. So I have a devotional practice, but I also practice mindfulness and meditation. Mindfulness is probably the second most used term in this area of work. Self-care is number one. Mindfulness is the other. We use it all the time. Uh, we don't always know what it is. So being mindful is about, for me, just being present in that space. So if you're doing your workout, that's what you're doing for your 30 minutes. You know, you're not, it, you're not at work. I don't take my phone. You know, I resent when people are like working in the gym when I'm trying to work out. So then like, get off the phone, get off, don't FaceTime, don't do this, you know, kind of stay in this space and uh, stay clear with that. And, and being with my family rejuvenates me. So depending on the situation. So being a good parent is self-care for me, showing up in the way that you said, Dr. Green, for my family, for my wife, for my daughter, and being present in the space when I'm there not just in my physical body, 
but in my whole body, you know, so having my mind on where I'm supposed to be. And I use gymnastics as an example. It actually is a mindfulness exercise for me to focus just on what my daughter's doing for 30 to 45 minutes and not allow it to want to back up and have a conversation in my head again or correct something that should have been done earlier in the day or prioritize the next hour or look to the next conference or the next presentation or the next talk. So that to me is, is an exercise in mindfulness, presence and focus. It doesn't cost anything to do that. You don't have to invest, you know, or, or you know, join, even join a gym or pay the fees. But what you can do is just allow yourself some space to be and give yourself permission for that space. And if you're gonna experience shame, this is how I negotiate with my clients. If you're gonna be shamed, you know, I'd much rather feel ashamed that I didn't get a report done than if I missed something at my daughter's gymnastics. I mean, I don't know if that's the best thing, but you know, if you're sort of negotiating, you shouldn't feel that at all. But you know, look at your priorities, who comes first. And I love my job and I love our profession, but there's so much in my life that's ahead of that. Right? I wanna show up for so many other things before I'm a social worker. And I don't know, I know everyone, but you know, my faith, my family, my friends, you know, there are things that come before this other part of my life. And I try to keep the balance there. So it's like that sacred space, you know, what does a healthy work-life balance look like? It's individual planning. That's our skill set, right? So turn the prism inward and you know, do some work on, you know, self-reflection there. What do you need? Set a goal set some accountability there. Don't do pie in the sky, Dr. Green. So I'm not going to be a marathon runner like you, but I can get up and do my workout maybe three days a week. And that's what works for me. Right. So setting reasonable goals, you know, just use as those social work skills that we all already have in our pockets and hold yourself accountable. And if you don't make it the first week, you know, there's no feedback here. There's just failure. You wouldn't shame your client. You just say, well, you know, keep trying, you know, maybe only made two workouts this week. Next week, we'll go for three. Don't give it up. And that's the difference to me, constructually in our brains between a ritual and a resolution. The resolution is I'm going to work out every day all year long. The ritual is setting a pattern that you can repeat that serves you. I think to, to answer your question, um, you know, there are definitely things that I do daily that I feel like I have to do or else I will not function, right? If I don't exercise, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be able to function. If I don't pray, I'm not going to be able to function. So those are in my mind for me personally, those are, those are non-negotiable, but for my self-care, I had to really train myself um, in order to be present for my husband and my three children after work that is very, very stressful. Um, when I pull into my garage, I set a timer for 10 minutes every day, set a timer on my watch or on my phone for 10 minutes. And for that 10 minutes, I am either going to pull out my journal and start writing down things that happened that I maybe, you know, am grateful for or that surprised me. I'm going to listen to my favorite song while I'm in the car by myself. <laughs> I'm going to drink a cup of hot coffee that I just bought on the road just for myself to really just ground myself so that I can transition to really fully be present for my family. And so I think that it's really important to know that it, it doesn't have to be bells and whistles. It doesn't have to be all the razzle dazzle. It doesn't even have to be a, a lot of things every day. But for me, that is a practice because what I was doing, where I was, where I was making the mistake is I, I have a lot of balls in the air always. I'm a mom. I've got three kids. They're in a million activities. I teach, I volunteer, all these things. And what I was doing was just running from one thing to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing to just try to keep it all together. And I realized that I was never 
ever going to be able to give or be able to really show up and be present if I wasn't taking just a little bit of time to focus. So my self-care practice is I have to have that, those 10 minutes just to focus. And I didn't start out at 10 minutes. I started out at three minutes and I said, okay, I'm going to just sit here for three minutes and breathe. I'm just going to do some deep breathing and then walk into my house. And even for my students, um, the students that I teach are master students, they're online students, they're non-traditional. So a lot of them are juggling families and field and jobs. And so even for my students, what I like to do in my evening classes is say, let's just take a breath before we start anything. I know y'all have been running all day. I know y'all have gotten here, your camera's off, you're eating while we're in class. You've got to do the things you have to do to survive. But let's just, let's just pause. Let's just take a breath. Let's just see where we are. Let's pay attention to what we notice so that we can be fully present. Those are really good practical tips. Um, and, and for me, I, I get up at 4.30, 5 o'clock a.m. It's very important. The way I start my day is the way I end my day. And if I have to be on campus for a class at 9, I'm there at 7, no later than 7.30, because I like to go into my room calm and peaceful and, and like to check in with my students. And so, and I love good music. And so I really appreciate the hour and 15 minute commute because I'm able to listen to my music and check in and, and, and spend some time with myself in that hour back um, to a home, I'm able to, to decompress from a long day and process everything before I walk in. So this has really been helpful. I wanna kind of shift gears to a question that we have in the chat. Uh, the question is, how do you recommend uh, coworkers, um, my coworker and I to advocate for our own self-care in an interdisciplinary team that is focused on the medical model. And that's for either panelist. Could you say that one one more time, Ron? That yes. was yeah, for me. Yes. So the so I am one of one of two social so, social workers in a large outpatient medical setting. It is definitely a medical model. How do you recommend my coworker and I advocate for our own self-care in an interdisciplinary team that is focused on the medical model? You know, I would cater to their model. You know, what does that model look like? What would the, your profession suggest is our healthy behaviors? You know, what are your health and wellness behaviors? maybe you know bring this up in the interprofessional meeting and ask every profession to contribute one behavior and be willing to draw that up and circulate to the team um, i don't think you can go in demanding that self-care be added to organizational policy it's going to take a while for this wave to flush through but i do think it's important to bring it up um, and also, I'd be curious in what other standards this shows up in. So, for example, in counseling, there's a standard, um, you know, my maybe look in speech language pathology or nursing, you know, other high nursing in particular has a high burnout rate. Are there standards there? And if there's not, well, let me let me talk to you a little bit about what social work's got going on. Who's interested? And if the the team looks at you and says, we are not interested in having a better performing team that does the best work that they can do, then that would surprise me. That would almost, that would be a liability. So, you know, I would just say, well, you know, this is a team building. This is an opportunity for us to have this discussion interprofessionally. And, you know, the medical model might prescribe more, you know, health-based interventions where social work may, may be more environmental or mental health, but that's why an interprofessional team could work on this. And I'd be really curious to see what comes out of that meeting. I would, I would, can I, I would like to add to that. I would also be clear, this is something um, Dr. Newell said in the beginning about self-care just kind of being there. You need to operationalize, you need to state 
clearly and specifically what you that would look like for you in that particular environment because different environments might um, take that language differently and if you also to add if you are talking about interdisciplinary every profession i had did a training on this like every um helping profession has a code of a code of ethics in terms of competence in terms of uh, operating um ethically meaning that you're not in terms of our competency about being aware being alert taking care of your taking care of yourself your medical self there's a a, a line in everybody's uh, code of ethics that talks about operating in a way that does not professional impairment that's what it is so you need to um be clear about how it is that you want your workspace to show up for you for self-care because it is not like um dr newell was saying it's kind of like the wave of that you need to be really clear clear about your ask and so that's how when you're talking to an interdisciplinary team that you got to talk the way that they understand it and then also have some outcome-based research, like go to the literature. I know that like a lot of our classes talk about outcomes, evidence-based research, find recent articles that support, um, talk about wellness and burnout, and particularly from whatever that discipline team is, from a counseling perspective, from a psychiatrist, a medical doctor, whatever, and say, hey, we were thinking about um, whatever that, how you operationalize it, this would be really great for some self-care, meaning this for our team. And this is what the research says about that. What do you all think we could do about how could we incorporate this? What a good project for students to work on in their agencies. It sounds to me, because I think Dr. Green mentioned that continuing education is a part of that, right? So social workers take on the responsibility of delivering that information to the larger audience. Thank you. So we have several comments and we're in several comments in the chat and hopefully we're able to address, address most of them. So we have another comment. Um, hi, I'm Molly. Call it. Hi, Mari, uh, Molly. She's one of my amazing students. So good to see you. Hey, Sharon. <laughs> hi, how are you? So good to see you. And thank you for joining us today. And so Molly, Molly, would you like to pose your question since you're open? Sure. Um, so I guess I, mine was more of a comment that I was hoping could lead to a little bit of discussion because I feel like Self-care is obviously so crucial to our profession, but as the word is becoming more mainstream, I almost feel like it's been a way for people and organizations to kind of point the finger at workers for why we're getting burned out instead of like actually addressing systemic issues. And so they're just like using it as like almost a band-aid. And so, yeah, I think, I think that's the biggest problem. Like I almost cringe when I hear the word self-care now because I feel like it's so often just a, a word that's meant to put a band-aid on bigger issues. And also having probably been weaponized. Dr. Green, you're, you're muted. Oh, okay. Getting my life. Did, did, you, have a, did you have a response to Molly's uh, comment? Yes. So I think it's about, um, I think it goes back to what I said earlier about, because a part of the unique way that we see things as social workers, that we see it in a pr the prism, that we see things my, um, a different through different lenses, person and environment, we, we understand the, the constructs of systems. And so it's also about changing the narrative of that, of saying, oh, well, when, when I say self-care, this is what I mean in terms of the organization. You have to be very ex explicit about that, what that looks like. So, but I think it continues to go back to like, you, you have to do that. You have to embody that. You got to do the thing that you want people to give to you. You got to do that. You got that's got to be a part of your practice. That's got to be like, for instance, I saw something about Zoom. If you're on Zoom, that means like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm on Zoom. I'm putting my video, my video and my mute off because I'm going to drink some water. I'm going to do some air squats or whatever it is. I'm going to do minutes of yoga. Then I'm going to come back or whatever that looks like for you. You got to practice the thing so that people will see that external to you. 
And when we talk up, when you look at person and environment, with those things that how you are packaged, how you, those things, how those affect other circles in your life, you got to do the thing to, to, to do the thing that you want to be reciprocated to you. And I also think that it's really important to think about what kind of policy is in your organization around self-care. If you're in an organization that is talking about self-care, that it's becoming so trendy or it's becoming really mainstream, then let's look at what the policy says. And if there's not any type of policy around, like organizational policy around self-care, then that is something that, that you and your other staff members need to be advocating for that's the messaging that's being come that's being given to you about self care self care self care but we always have to point that back to policy, right? As research informs practice, policy also informs practice. And so looking at your agency, seeing what type of policies there are around self-care, and if there aren't any, really working with the leadership team to try to develop that, and, and also seeing what are some tangible materials and resources that can be given to your team about what self-care looks like. Maybe that means you doing a, a one hour noontime lunch, you know, once, once, a, once a month on self-care for as professional development for the employees, or maybe that's something that you all begin to implement. But I think it's so important as organizations start to talk about all these things, if it's in the policy, then they're able to be held accountable to it. So accountability and self-care is really important when we talk about systems and organizational structure. Thank you all so much. Uh, another, pal, another attendee posed a question. Um, I would love to hear the palace thoughts on self-care as a privilege. Um, and so went on to say, I interact with so many young social workers um, who are incredibly in challenging spaces and you know, holding multiple jobs. And so what does that look like, uh, self-care as a privilege? Ooh. <laughs> so when doc, Dr. Newell was saying, well, Car uh, Dr. Foster, I'm saying future Dr. Foster, when y'all were talking about like these systematic uh, constructs, I was immediately thinking about social justice. I was thinking about capitalism and what that what those things mean in terms of that and also like the media perpetuation of self-care is supposed to be a luxury it's supposed to how it has been com uh, commodified and capitalized like oh well you you, you have to earn self-care and so i think social work addresses that like because that's what we push against in terms of being culturally competent and understanding the messaging behind what is said depending on how we have to navigate the world, whether we're in the center or on the margins. And so as a student, there is a power differential that happens. So there's different things that, that different resources that you may have, but also it goes back to, it is not, self-care is not a lux, it's not a luxury, it's not something that you earn. It is not something that you have to, to be a certain body type or race ethnicity or gender or ability or geographic location or a uh, social status to have i think about the times when i was a kid like like sitting on the porch drinking tea rocking in the rocking chair after uh <laughs> after a week of work like just being still doing nothing like your body in rest right like your body not moving and not in, in listening to what the messaging is telling you about what your body is supposed to be doing. Those are constructs when we talk about self-care and when we come into self, come into social work, we come into with our different stories and why we came into social work. If you are finding that those things are tugging, those are probably opportunities and invitations for you to work on some of the narratives that you have about what your body is supposed to be doing, how you're supposed to be doing it. And when you're supposed to be doing it, and if you're thinking that self-care is a luxury, is something that you have to achieve, that is not, that's faulty. <laughs> that's, that's negative, some negative cognitions around that. It's, fa it's faulty. You are a human being navigating this world. Your body needs rest. Your body needs sleep. Your body needs water. 
for all the, the complex things that it does that you cannot see, you, you do not have to earn rest. You don't have to earn sleep. And it also is like a push against like what it talks about productivity in terms of your body supposed to be emotional, supposed to output, output. What self-care looks like? Oh, it looks like a $5,000 vacation. No, it doesn't. It looks like having several seats, like what my mom would tell me. Go, go sit down. <laughs> sit down and be where you are. And as a student and as a, a person in, the, you know, different systems, it does, it does give that appearance, but that's why I think it's important for you to operationalize, for you to talk about what self-care means to you, where, where you are, how you are packaged in this world, what that means and what that looks like, and not to get into a comparison thing, because it will, you won't do it because you think you can't achieve it. You won't go sit down because you think you didn't earn it. You won't uh, say your affirmations because you think that's reserved for a certain class or economic status or a certain gender or a certain race or certain ethnicity, that is not true. You are a human being. Go, go rest, go sit down, take care of yourself so that you can, you can do it for the, long, for the long haul so that you can take care of yourself. And so you can take care of the people that you've been called to serve. Thank you, Dr. Green. Dr. Noah, uh, would you like to respond to that? I have another question that I was gonna pose to you. But certainly you could go on if you want to add to Dr. Green. No, I thought Dr. Uh, Green did that beautifully. There's no yes. need to add. And when you think of something as privilege, sometimes the narrative is, I can't have that. That's that other person's privilege. I see that as a barrier to self-care, right? Shift that yes. thought in, in exactly, you know, here's what I can do. And the privilege mm -hmm. is getting to be with your family and taking care of yourself. That's your privilege. Yes, yes been able to individualize what self-care looks like for you. Not here, but but where you but where we all are in our own spaces and places. So uh, Dr. Newell, um, I would like for you to uh, take on this question, if you will. As someone who is in the role to change policy in my organization, does requiring our staff to take their PTO in a timely manner a form of self-care? So when we get in the organizational policy issue, that's a whole nother lunch and learn. There's very little policy anywhere on, here's what self-care looks like at this company. How policy tends to exist is maybe in EAP. So most organizations will say, you know, if something's, you know, going on and you need mental health care or you need, you know, you have a substance use disorder, you go to our EAP folks and they'll handle it. That's employee assistance programs. That's where most, most organizations have that. I've yet to see like a, you know, a clear policy on we're going to give these, you know, employees this much this week and you're required to take it. And so that's interesting to, for me to kind of think about. So requiring workers to take paid time off, which means, you know, if they're accumulating too much time and a supervisor is noting that, you know, this worker is doing 60 hours a week or hasn't had a vacation in two years. As a supervisor myself, you know, I would certainly say, you know, I think a good way to frame that up might be, when was the last time you took any time away from work? And what does life look like for you not at work? Because that can be a sign. And someone mentioned the evil. So in my research, the evil word is burnout. <laughs> and, and the other one is secondary traumatic stress. I think if you look at the longevity of our, our work in this area, you know, wave one, we burned everybody out on burnout. Like I've been to conferences literally where people say, if I have to listen to you say that again, I'm just going to find another workshop. Like we've done that work. We've been training on it since the early 80s. And then there was another wave where we traumatized all the social workers, telling them they were going to be traumatized by the work. What we haven't done and what I have found in my work is that we don't really focus on resiliency. We don't focus on how keeping our workers whole, right, serves everything. So I sort of look at it from that framework. And someone mentioned self-care. You know, I, I move away from that word sometimes. And, you know, I think that's the key. But I really like to talk about keeping our our workers professionally resilient? What does that look like for you? What in your life serves you? So, and you go to that conversation and I can't imagine that, you know, requiring someone to take their paid time off, what does that mean? You know, I wouldn't discourage the person. I would say, but what is your purpose here? 
you know, how is never taking leave serving you? And what are you missing out on by not taking a break from this work? And my goal is to keep you in this organization and in social work for as long as I can. And there's no data that says not taking paid time off for years or not taking time away from work and taking that breath we're talking about is going to serve you or serve your family. And if they say, well, I don't have anywhere to go, it's COVID, you just go home, like Sharana says, sit down. <laughs> you know, you have a somewhere to go, you know, find a space. And if work becomes, you know, I've always sort of taught against this in my practice. If you become your work, then that's all you'll be. And you'll forget about all the other things, right? So you don't want to become, you want to always be a social worker, but you don't want to become your job. That is not healthy, right? And there's a difference between being a practitioner of child welfare and then being, you know, child welfare being your identity. And I saw that at the VA. I mean, I saw I, people retire from the VA after 30 years and have, you know, months of paid leave, you know, and that wasn't me. You know, I was burning mine as quick as I got it because, I, you know, but the idea is how is this going to serve you now you're at the end of your career you've missed all that time it might serve you financially but some of that sick leave is going to go and you know maybe you want to think about that and i always think about that from that dimension too if you become your work that's the road to burnout if you cannot think outside of that dimension of your life then we can start talking about burnout right then we can really talk about you know, where you could make some changes. Thank you, Dr. Newell. So, so uh, Ms. Foster, I have one question from the chat I would like for you to address. And then I want to welcome our very own uh, Dr. Hatcher, our very own Dean Hatcher to come in and, and add some words. And then our own Peggy uh, will come back and talk about CEUs. And so maybe in 60 seconds, like an ele elevator, if you could, I have a question from a PhD student, uh, and I really want to come back and address this question. It says, how to overcome the feelings of guilty when we as PhD students, when there are tons to do because of the requirements from our study, I and other students have the same challenges and are feeling most of the time. Hmm. So if you could address that, I think that is very near and dear because we're talking about students, right? And how to overcome uh, these uh, these challenges with the amount of requirements that are, are and their expectations. Absolutely. So um, I, I am a DSW student um, at the University of Alabama and I have an amazing cohort. And, you know, it's really, really important, I think, as you were thinking about putting forth your best work, whether it's putting forth your best research, putting forth your best paper, being able to, to read all of the required materials so that you're ready to have that discussion when you have class or you're ready to give your input when you're in a group. In order to do that well, you have to be well yourself. I mean, it goes back to our the very top of the hour in our conversation. In order for us to be able to produce, in order for us to be able to be our best selves, to show up as a, as a really ready student, as a great mom, as a thoughtful partner, in order to do those things, you have to be able to, to give yourself permission and give yourself grace to take care of yourself. And if you are a PhD student, I know that you're probably super driven. I know that you're probably an Enneagram three. I'm a three. I know you're probably an achiever in, in the strengths finder. I'm an achiever. Those of us who are type A achievers, go, 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 go. Sometimes what we need to do is give ourselves permission to, to love ourselves, to make ourselves a priority so that we can do well in all of these other aspects of our life. And so that guilt that you're feeling or that shame that you're feeling, if you're not, you know, reading every single line or, you know, if you're not staying up till 3 a.m. To, to do all this research, that is because you're not allowing yourself the grace and the permission to really be the best that you can be. Like Dr. Green said, you need sleep. 
right? You need to drink your water. You need food. You need sustenance. You got to make sure that you're taking care of yourself and give yourself that grace and that permission. Self-care is not a privilege. It's not a luxury. It's, it's a necessity. And so in order for that to be a necessity, you've got to be able to be kind to yourself. Thank you so much, Ms. Foster. Uh, this panel would not have been possible without Dr. Green, Dr. New, and Ms. Foster. Thank you so much. If anything that I could do, Ms. Uh, Peggy could do, we can do to support you as we move forward. Please do not hesitate to call on us. Thanks, attendees. Now I want to turn it over to our very own Dean Hatcher, and then we'll come back with Peggy to, do, to talk about CEUs. Dean Hatcher. Thank you so much. It's been such a joy to be able to join in on this discussion about how we as social workers take care of ourselves, um, talking about it and considering it, as I've heard the panelists say, by the way, wonderful job panelists, um, is we focus on optimum health and well-being in our classrooms, in our practices, and in our research every day. And as I just recently heard, it definitely should not be considered a luxury or a privilege when we want it ourselves. It's actually a human right. It's a necessity, but it's actually a human right. And so we need to transform our perspectives on when we do this. Burnout, as we've heard, um, it used to be really focused a lot on that term a lot. And now we switch gears and I always say self-care, how we focus on self-care. It sounds nicer for corporations. And so again, we want to be mindful that we don't want to sacrifice our own well-being for the health of our careers. And so that is for students um, and that is for employees. I saw in the chat about someone saying, can they force someone to take their PTO? That's their right to not take their PTO. And so is, we have our responsibility to make sure we begin to figure out how do you, we want to take care of our optimum health and our well-being? And we should not um, begin to think about how to determine it for others. Um, again, it's wonderful being able to hear this conversation. I heard a lot about self-care, but the full title of the discussion was about also resilience and healing. And so the healing part is receiving the fact that you have this human right to take care of yourself and not deter, not really make yourself sick for the health of your career. Um, so again, re uh, receive that healing part of this discussion. Um, and again, I uh, again, happy new year. We're in the midst of a pandemic. And then we all be have to begin to navigate how do we begin to heal um, ourselves as we prepare to make other lives better um, in the midst of this. Um, again, thank you for allowing me to provide some final words. And I love the fact that when I did sign on a few minutes late, coming from a meeting, it was over 200 people on this, this discussion because it is important for us as social workers. So again, thank you all. And I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Sharon. Thank you so much, Dean Hatcher. Uh, I will turn it over to uh, Peggy. Great, thanks again, everybody for joining us and being mindful of your time. Um, just wanna let you know that we will be emailing out your CEU form later this afternoon or tomorrow. So please watch for that. And then also we are gonna, I'm just gonna put a, a plug in there next month, we have um, our annual Ethel Hall Colloquium. So please watch your email, our social media platforms, for future content that we will be offering through Noontime Knowledge Series, as well as our CEU um, program and then other activities. Thanks again, everybody. This was wonderful and have a great day.